Uh, one announcement. There are no announcements. Um, uh, weekly events are all up until we go back in in the new year. So I'm not going to study the Bible for until next year. Um, <laughs> the ladies' Bible study will be on this Friday. One last study. I guess that's the announcement. That wasn't the announcement. Um, also, I have a book giveaway. Uh, I'm going to do this. I have no idea who's anybody who had a birthday. Unless Mackenzie had a birthday, maybe we'll find out. But um, I will receive any gifts you have. <laughs> <laughs> so the book is Gospel Fear uh, by Jeremiah Burroughs. He's a very popular modern author. <laughs> Um, was born in 1599, and uh, great, great book. So, um, whoever's birthday is closest to today's date wins the book. What about your daughter? Yes. <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> Family members can't win. Family members can't win. They're just all <laughs> And I got numerous copies of the book. So, whose birthday is closest to today's date? On the 7th of what? December. Really? Oh, well, that's a winner. Oh. Okay, uh, Tony, would you just often have your breakfast? <laughs> yes. Oh. Sure, Dan. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, two Sundays ago when I was speaking, the first service had everybody on this side. The second service had everybody on this side. So now it's just sort of... Is that to bring balance? Do we need balance in our lives? Do we? Anybody remember what was preached last week? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a softball, if I ever threw one. <laughs> last week, Dan preached on Abram and Lot separating. And it struck me in some of the things that he said about Abram trusting the sovereignty of God and being willing to take what Lot didn't choose, and trusting that God would still bless him. And that based on Lot's choice, Abram looked and God said, everything you see will be given to you and your descendants. And the next thing that Abram did was build an altar and worship. Because of the generosity of God. One of, the, one of the phrases that came out of Dan's mouth last week that I wrote down was, when we recognize the generosity of God, it makes us a generous people. And are we sort of swooping down on the season of giving right now? Being generous with our resources, that we might be a blessing to somebody else? Well, if you would turn your Bibles to Psalm 112. Do you have this in my mind? Psalm children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. Such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. The wicked will see this and be infuriated. They will grind their teeth in anger. They will sling away their hopes for them. And as Dan prayed, just as he just prayed in opening up the service, he gave thanks for the gospel. He gave thanks for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would be a people that would look on the generosity of God, as has been said from this pulpit by several people several times. I don't deserve God's grace. But instead, I have. And it should make us the most generous people in the world when we think of the generosity of God and His providing the salvation that destroys the enmity between us and Him. So, as you continue in worship this morning, I pray that your generous bones would be invigorated and that you would worship in a way that would reflect how generous God is for us. Father, we are again struck by your generosity, by giving us what we don't deserve instead of what we do. So, Father, I pray that we would overflow with generosity towards our fellow brothers and sisters and to 
to those around us that we meet on a day by day basis. Help us to be those that reflect your glory and your grace, that others might see it and be drawn to him. We pray in Jesus' name. Please stand and join us as we sing O Holy Night.
Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7. As Mark lights this third candle, I want to just simply draw your attention to the prophets. The Messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament are some of the richest portions to go back and study in the Word. The more you see the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, specifically in the, in the works of the prophets, in the message of the prophets. I just want to look at Isaiah 7 to remind you of a very classic passage um, to bring this to our remembrance. Chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. And it goes further on in this, and what's so fascinating about these Old Testament prophecies is that there's a, there's a historical context that these phrases fit within. And then you come to the New Testament, and you see the New Testament author bring a specific phrase from these passages and then point to Christ by those passages. Um, now, I'm not saying those Old Testament passages in and of themselves were not pointing to Jesus. I absolutely believe that. But as the New Testament authors, the interpreters of the Old Testament, directly point to Christ in the Old Testament, um, it really touches on the unification of the unifying of the whole Bible. That this is not 66 books simply pieced together for the purpose of, of teaching about religion. There's a unity here. There, these are the inspired writings of the living God. And the centerpiece of them is the Lord Jesus Christ, Old and New Testament. Let me pray and share with you kind of where I want to take us this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, um, God, as we ponder the first advent, your first coming. And we see the humiliation of the Son of God coming in the form of mankind to a fallen world, to a poor peasant girl, <coughs> born in a stable. Father, those passages that speak of your coming to rescue us becomes so much, even more beautiful to see what you did, what you became with the purpose and goal of saving the people. Father, it is so humbling to consider the God of the universe coming and laying his life down for the penalty of my sin. Dear God, I, I praise you this morning. I honor you. You are the one true and living God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are my King. You are my Lord. And I thank you for my redemption. Please speak to us now from your word. Lord, as we consider one of the greatest truths that will come between our ears this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me give you a little bit of a preaching path. Um, I'm going to take a breather from Genesis until 2021. Uh, so, this week, I want, I'm going to do kind of a two-part series this week and next week, then a Christmas message, and then I have a special New Year's message that's very heavy on my heart I'll bring to you uh, on that Sunday. But for this week and for next week, there's two messages that are very much connected that have been heavy on my mind and heart, and I want to share them with you, especially in this year, and especially in this time of this. So today, I want us to look at the message we're called to declare. And then next week, I want to look at the messenger who's called to declare it. So the message we are called to declare and the messenger who's called to declare it. 
is this little two-part series that I'm going to do um, this week and next. And so this morning, I want us to consider the message we're called to declare. I don't know about you, but the longer I'm a Christian, and after I became a Christian, my ears started to get more and more trained to listen for truth in a fallen world. And to catch error in a fallen world. Um, whether it was the news, whether it was a relative, whether it was a friend, that my ear could catch, no, that's not, I don't think that's true. I don't believe that's true. Now, I'm not just saying that, I'm not saying only Christians do this. I think unbelievers do this too. The trouble is they don't have the truth. But to some level, all of us have a point of discernment. Well, after you're born again, you are saved. You're involved by the Spirit of God. You have the Word of God. And you're drinking that, drinking in that precious truth of the Word. The more you are developing a filtration system, spiritually speaking, to catch false, um, false doctrine. And it's interesting to see that uh, for me in my own life personally, but even to, as now a parent, hearing... Um, false gospels or false things in this world. Where before, I would hear, you know, yeah, it's just the world's what they do. But now, as a, as a dad, I even more so listen intently when people speak, especially when people speak to my family. To hear, is that real? Not real? And the longer we're in the scripture, the more we're in the word, the more that word develops an even greater filtration system. So now the screen is even stronger, even more difficult for things to pass through. And the more we're drinking of the word, the more we're saying, wow, this world is truly messed up. More than I ever thought. Even at conversion, I thought it was crazy. Ten years ago, I thought it was crazy. But now, I know it's crazy. And then the more the stronger you go, the more you say, it's almost as if the concepts and the world system is the polar opposite of the truth of God's word. And so, as I've been listening to news, as I've been listening to a lot of human beings, as I've been listening to my own heart, watching what's happening in our country, considering all that's taking place in the whole globe, Here's a question I've been asking, and I want to propose to you and have you ponder today and we're doing the rest of this week, so that way next week the writer asks you what I preach on, all of you answer. Do <laughs> you have the message? It's not the Bible translations. Do you have the gospel message? Is it clear to you? Does it seem fuzzy? I remember as a little boy when I heard people say gospel, I thought that meant the uh, a type of music. Old time gospel hymns or gospel singing. I thought it was a music genre when I was a little boy. And it is, kind of. But I didn't know what the gospel was. Now, did I know what it was? Yes. Did I know that that word gospel, what that meant? Not necessarily. It was fuzzy to me. Years later, I remember coming to a, a profound clarity of the gospel and my heart just being moved. Now, was I saved prior to that? Yeah, I think I was, but in a fresh way, I knew what the gospel was. And it moved my heart powerfully. And the sweeter the gospel becomes, the greater your filtration system becomes to see the false gospels in our world. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. This message is not an exposition. Let me say that from the get-go. This morning's message is more my heart spilling out a little bit. We'll be looking at a lot of scripture, though. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. The, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the Power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the it being the gospel, in this good news, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, 
the righteous shall live by faith. And so I want you to ponder this. You have a friend, and the friend comes to you and says, I have been wrestling a lot lately about death. I've been wrestling about death. I've been wrestling about if there's something that comes after death. I, I'm really struggling with it. What happens? It seems like when somebody dies, something leaves. There's just a shell there. Where did the actual person go? Can you, can you help me with that? If, if somebody came in on a silver platter, said, would you share with me your perspective on what happens to somebody when they die? And why do you think that is the way it is? Would you launch... Would you back off? Where would you be? It's just a rhetorical question to ponder. Where would you be, Christian, if you had somebody come to you? You didn't pursue them. You didn't go to them. You didn't knock on their door. There's no track in your hand. They just simply came to you right in your face and said, I need to know the gospel. What is it? Are you ready to launch with that? Is my question. Well, before I talk, touch on the truth, the message, the Christian message we take to the world, I want to touch on a few false gospels that are everywhere um, in this country and throughout the world. These gospels are everywhere. By the way, I'm going to say the word gospel, I think, 175 times this morning. And so that word gospel simply means good you read in the text of Scripture, it makes reference to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to touch on what all that entails in just a bit. But first, what are some false gospels? And I've broken into two categories I want you to ponder with me. Two categories of false gospels. One is an earthbound gospel, one is the eternal gospel. All of it under the banner of false, but the quote-unquote good news, the message, the thing that this world, they're giving themselves to, and they believe is where they can give their efforts to. So first is earthbound. And first and foremost, I point to the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel simply meaning that Jesus Christ died, and sometimes they will give a little bit of effort to say, you died so that when you go to heaven when you die, but then they spend the rest of their time talking to you about Jesus Christ died on the cross in order to make you healthy, wealthy. By his stripes we're healed. They take that passage right out of Isaiah 53, strip it from its context, and then they say, see, therefore Jesus died so that way you can be healed. If you just get enough faith, you'll be healed. Somebody doesn't get healed, they say they didn't have enough faith, they walk away in shame, and the guy walks away wealthier. It happens all day, every day, throughout the world. Roger and I are in Kenya, books all over the place, the teaching all over the place, tons of money spent on this prosperity gospel, which is nowhere in Scripture, which is sickening, and it muddies up the entire truth of the true gospel. The prosperity gospel is everywhere. Another one, the political gospel. Again, earthbound. If we just get the right person in office, then we're finally going to get it where it needs to be. So vote. Now, is there anything wrong with voting? Anything wrong with politics? Well, that's a big question. We could all say yes. But I would say, no, that's not my point here. I'm not saying politics is evil. I'm not saying voting is evil. By no stretch. What is evil is when we see it as our great and our great Savior. And we say, if we just vote correctly, if we just get everybody in line, we'll finally have what we want. And so rather than the declaration of the gospel, it's the declaration of who you should vote for passing all by. Again, it's not evil, but when it is your everything, it is evil. Another earthbound gospel is what we see, I'm, I'm titling this the social justice gospel. This concept of uh, if we can just simply make everything completely equal and, and, and everybody's on the exact same left playing field all the time, everywhere, which, by the way, never happens, then everything will be fine. If we just give our attention to making sure social justice is complete and everybody's level and everybody's good, then we're going to be fine. It never happens, and that's not the gospel, and it's a false gospel, and it's a fool's errand in the grand scheme. Again, is it wrong to seek equality in this world? No. 
But when it's your everything, and that's the gospel, that's the good news that you have to go take to this world, my dear friend, you've missed it. And the last one might get me in trouble, but that's fine. The retirement gospel. This concept, in our country specifically, where if you can just save enough, so that way, eventually, you can just sit tight, relax, and there's no more pressure on you, that's what your life is about. I stood with a woman two weeks ago. His husband was outside working, died, and she said what I've heard a handful of times so far in this job as chaplain. He was retired. This gospel of work as hard as you can, save as much as you can, so that way you can be at ease for the next 20 years of your life, or the last 20 years of your life, is a false gospel. Now, those are earthbound gospels. Here's some false gospels you hear where folks are speaking about eternity. Number one, salvation by death. This one is kind of tricky. Um, it, it's this concept that when somebody dies, everybody wants to come around and say how wonderful they were and say, of course they're in heaven, we don't know they're in heaven because everyone's in heaven. Now, your filtration system should catch that. Alarms going off, bell, ding, 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 ding. You should hear that very clearly. Another one is salvation by Jesus without faith. This is the universalist, where Jesus Christ died. He paid the penalty for all sin. Regardless of your faith or not, you will be in heaven through the death of Jesus. He's a nice guy, laid his life down for you, so be all you can be. Again, alarms going off. Number three, salvation by good works. If there's one that is most prevalent in the world. So I'm going to make a separation here between the world and with the religious world. In the world, this is the greatest one that we hear all the time. I have dear friends in my life who have said to me, I'm not a bad guy. I've done a lot of good. If there is a God, I know he would not punish now, there's all kinds of things we could pick it that way. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But just, again, beloved, would that bother you if you heard it? Mm -hmm. Thus far, all these that I've shared with you, would, would you be a little bit thrown off your tracks when you hear somebody talk like that, knowing this isn't it? That's not it. Finally, in religious circles, I use that as vague as I can. Salvation by good works and faith. This is where, and this is what's so sneaky for all of us as believers, is that we believe in justification by faith, by faith alone. But then sometimes in contexts of church life, of Christian life, we start to act like that good works are actually a piece. And what I mean by that is that they're a necessity for our salvation. Yes, I have faith in Jesus. I remember somebody in a very large religion telling me years ago, yes, I have faith in Jesus, but I also believe very strongly you have to, and then gave me this litany. My filter system caught it, and I thought, no, you don't have the gospel. That's not the good news of the word of God. That's not the gospel. And so here we are. There's the friend. The friend just told you, I'm really struggling. Can you tell me what you believe? My hope and my prayer, my earnest prayer as one of your pastors is this. I hope none of those is what you thought. Hope you think of any of those. Now I want us to think about um, a passage that is one of the strongest in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 1. If you turn there with me, Galatians chapter 1, and hear what the Apostle Paul has to say. Verse 6. I'm going to pick up the first one because setting it in its proper context, I think, gives extra emphasis. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor 
through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with him, who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, in almost every one of Paul's letters, this is the point where he touches on, I won't be the proper word, where he, he, he commends them for something they've been doing. Whether he commends them for their faith or for their love, but this is usually the point in a letter from the Apostle Paul where he says, we give thanks to God always for you, who? And then fills that in. In this letter, he doesn't even go near it. He, there's, a, there's a pressure on him in the text, and so he just simply bursts out, I'm astonished. By what? I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. <clears throat> But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now listen carefully, beloved, what, what he says about these false gospels. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And it's very interesting to me that in the context of the book of Galatians, the false gospel given from the Judaizers to the churches in Galatia is a mixture of faith and works. Yes, have faith in Jesus, but you need to add to that works of the law, circumcision and obedience to the law, so on and so forth. And so the Apostle Paul is not, is not saying what I've heard some believers say, yeah, they have faith, and they've got some other things kind of messed up, and then, and then kind of loose. He, no, Paul says, if this gospel is the gospel you believe, you are cursed. You are hell-bound if you do not have the true gospel. That should, it should, it should bring us up straight, and it should cause us to just pause for a second and think, if that's true, how many individuals that I've come in contact with just in this week will be in hell if they die? Just this week, if that is true. Remember, beloved, don't ever forget this point. The exclusivity of Jesus, the exclusivity of the gospel, is one of the greatest irritants to this world that there is. When you say there is salvation in no other person, there is salvation in no other message, it is only through Christ and Christ alone, you can watch it boil up very hot, very fast in our world. Jesus is not a way. He's the way. Okay. <clears throat> I want to look at three passages of Scripture with you and touch on six building blocks of the true gospel. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 19. So that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And so explicit, isn't it? Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, but now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. 
Catch, catch these, these pieces, beloved. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. You get the righteousness by faith, and the object of the faith is Jesus Christ. Now, what he does here, listen, this, he, he, he wants to make this argument so crystal clear. He says, for there is no distinction. What do you mean? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There are a lot of explicit passages of Scripture that touch on the truth of the Gospel. This one is, in my opinion, one of the very tops. If there's a passage, if you, look this way, brother, if you, if you have an opportunity this week and somebody happens to say, will you share with me kind of the centerpiece of what you believe? You told me you're a Christian. I'm, I'm curious. How did that work? If I don't have any background in Christianity or any really religion, can you share with me? This passage would be a great one. Now, is it going to take some explaining? Yeah, sure. But look where you are. You're explaining the gospel to the unsaved from the word of God. Let me give you another passage. Romans chapter 10. The Apostle Paul spills out a bit of his heart here in reference to his brother's these are unsaved Jews contextually. He says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Now listen to what he talks about. This is so fascinating to me. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And this is where we ask the question, what does he mean by God's righteousness? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Did you hear what he said there? I bear witness, these group, this group of people, they have a righteousness. In other words, there's a moral ethic. There's a, there's a desire to be righteous. But it's not according to knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of the truth. Who said it's true? God said it's true. And so they, they have this righteousness in their mind. Well, put it this way. Say you have a, a, a good neighbor that happens to be um, of a different religion. They don't have the gospel, but they're the best neighbor you've ever had. Kind-hearted, they care for you, they care for your kids, they bring cookies over continually, and your heart spills out. These are great people. They're very kind, they're moral, they pay their taxes, they have a righteousness, but they don't have the righteousness of God. Namely, the righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ. The righteousness, by the way, the only righteousness that God will receive. That's why it's called the righteousness of God. Philippians chapter 3, last text. And this one hits the nail on the head just as sharply. Philippians chapter 3. This is a passage you're pretty, probably familiar with where the Apostle Paul is talking about his pedigree. Okay? So he's talking about his background. And as he reads his background, all the Jews of that day, the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day, they would be patting this man on the back for that which he had. If anybody has bragging rights, the Apostle Paul's got bragging rights. And I want you to hear carefully what he calls his bragging rights. Philippians 3, verse 2, talking about the Jewish false teachers at the time. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. 
For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Done. Now he's going to give a personal example. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Well, do tell, Paul, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, you want to see my zeal? As a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, according to the scribes and Pharisees, according to that day, blameless. So I was born in the right way, I followed the law completely, and I am head and shoulders over anybody around me. If anyone was ever capable to declare themselves being righteous among those around them, the Apostle Paul was capable of doing it. Listen to what he says about this righteousness. For whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, refuse, dung is a very literal translation, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so here's six building blocks I encourage you to ponder. These are, the way I, would, I kind of put it is, is uh, keep them in your pocket. So it's like six marbles. Keep those in your pocket all the time. Meditate on them, ponder them, think about them. And if God gives you the opportunity to share with somebody over the holidays or just a neighbor while you're out for a walk, those six marbles should be there in your pocket. Pull out the six marbles, and you are ready to go. Number one, first marble, a holy God. This whole thing begins with a glorious, holy creator God. One who is absolutely perfect in every way. Absolute perfect standard. There is one supreme being who has made everything, who is sovereign over everything, and who is absolutely 100% holy, set apart, different, righteous, altogether good. Well, your second one, a fallen humanity. A fallen humanity. I don't know about you guys, but... This one is, a, is one that takes a little bit of time to discuss and seek to bring out to our loved ones around us who don't believe the gospel, who don't know, who don't care. Because their concept is that man's basically good. No, he's not. He's bad. He's fallen. He's sinful. He's lost. What would, what would be interesting, if you want to, just do a personal study. Sit down and write down all the New Testament descriptions of man before he comes to Christ. Fallen, dead, lost, sinful, backfire, hater of God, poison of ass under his tongue. That's you. That's me. Prior to Christ. So fallen humanity is a piece of cake to figure out biblically. Biblically. But to convince the fallen heart, the heart's fallen is a miracle that love the Spirit. Number three, third marble, pull it out. A perfect standard, a law by which all are judged. God says perfect or judgment. I want perfection or you are judged for all eternity in my wrath. Perfection or bust. Grab the fourth marble, out of your pocket. Number four, a perfect payment for sin, for the penalty of sin, rather. Right? A perfect payment for the penalty of sin. Did you not see that it kept saying in the passage in reference to where that righteousness came from? It came from Jesus. It came from Jesus. It came from Jesus. The whole Bible, crystal clear. There's your grid. Gospel. Jesus Christ. There's salvation. No other name under heaven given among men. Salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone. So, 
There is no other righteousness. There is no other payment. You can't make God pleased by what you do. God is satisfied. He will accept righteousness from one category, and one category only, and that's his son. It is the righteousness of Christ or hell. That's the option. That is the gospel. And the world screams and fights and calls us names and all that kind of stuff. I know that. You know that. It makes Thanksgiving uncomfortable. But the reality is, when it all boils down, I want you just to stop and think, wait a second, wait a second. The world is upset that I'm saying that there's only one way to salvation, but that one way is God's death. Top it. I dare you, world, top that. You mean you want to say that I add my little works to the death of God in the flesh? Are you kidding me? No wonder Paul asks the Galatians, who's bewitched you or who's put a spell over you to actually leave the sufficiency of Jesus for the sake of adding your works to his sufficiency? Because, guys, if you, if you see what I'm doing here with these marbles, I'm kind of lying out. By the way, don't ever lose your marbles. But as I'm going to put there somewhere. As you, as you line this up and build this up, there's a progression here. As you share this with an unsaved individual, a holy God, a fallen humanity, a perfect standard, that person right there in that moment should, by the Spirit of God's work in his heart, say, I fail to sin. And that's where you say, Yes, you did. But I know somebody who met the standard. Marble pie. The great exchange. This is the, the glory of the New Testament. Uh, this is the glory of the Old Testament. This is the glory of the gospel. That the righteousness of Christ becomes Dan Mason's righteousness and the payment for my sin, Jesus Christ endured. Jesus suffered for sin, I did this week. And the week before, and the week before, and the week before, and the week before. Jesus Christ suffered for the sin I'll do next week. The Lord Jesus has taken the penalty for my sin, and his righteousness is, big word, imputed to me. All it simply means is it's accredited to my account. So when the Father looks on Dan, he sees the righteousness of Christ not the sin of Dan. By faith in that atoning sacrifice of Jesus in Marvel 6, a renewed, fresh, brand new fellowship with the living God. Romans chapter 5, if you would. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How do you have peace with God? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. These are the six marbles, if you will. I challenge you to keep in your pocket, ready to roll all the time. You've just got it. The Lord may grant you the opportunity. You may only have, uh, let, me, let me say this real quick, guys, because it's important. Sometimes in evangelism, we don't necessarily have somebody's undivided attention for an hour to explain all this. I know that. The idea of the marble concept is, is it's not... You're going to pull out all six and say, now sit down for an hour and I'm going to talk and you're going to listen. By the way, here we go. And then you may not have that opportunity, but you may have the opportunity to pull out that first one. And you're going to see him again the next day at work or the next day in the grocery store. The neighbor is there walking their dog and you're bump into him. And they may say, you know, I'm just struggling with that. Like, if God is so holy, Dan, I've got to tell you, I, I've done some bad things. Well, there's a second marble. But you having these in your pocket, ready to roll, to share the good news, the one true saving message. 
is where it's at. Well, for time's sake, let me move to the next point, and that's this. And this is the candy of this message, I would argue. All that is yours in Christ. Now, I'm sure you can probably add to this list. This is not exhaustive, but I just want to give a, a flavor. Regeneration. Spiritual life. New birth. You've gone from death to life. He has given his precious Holy Spirit. You are indwelt by the Spirit of God if you are truly born again. And that said, that's, the scripture says that that is given as a guarantee of your salvation. You have the written word of God. 66 books. Penned by many different authors, but all inspired under the one true living God. And the Spirit of God instructing you and illuminating your mind through the Word of God. You have fellowship with the saints. I don't know about you, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I grow in grace and in the knowledge of my work, the more the body of Christ means to me. And the more the world, it, it still appeals to my heart, I still wrestle with the flesh, but... The longer I'm a believer, the more I feed on the word and good theology and solid, the more I'm, I'm excited when I meet somebody who has the same love. It, is, it, it should be natural that those who love Jesus with all their heart would get along well with those who love Jesus with all their heart. Now, do we have friction sometimes? Of course we do, but beloved. Fellowship of the saints is a precious, precious gift. Access to the Father. As we just read in Romans 5, 1 and 2. You can speak to God all day, every day. There are times I call people and they don't answer their call. Because they have call ID. <laughs> God always, through Christ, always hears me. I have never prayed a prayer through the Lord Jesus where the Father said, no, Dan, busy right now. Ever. I look forward to a resurrected body. I look forward to the joy that is inexpressible in the new heavens and new earth for all eternity. And here's the... This one encapsulates everything I just said, but it's also kind of a cherry on the top. This is the one that I don't hear said often. I don't know why. You get... See, it's interesting when we, I've been reading a, a very interesting book right now, and he's been speaking on this concept of, we talk about all the benefits that come from Christ, and we forget to remember, we have Christ. We have him. By the way, last, last verse I want to take your attention to. Um, in John chapter 17, and then I'll, I'll uh, wrap up. I'm going over. Sorry. Not that sorry. Actually, I'm sorry at all. John 17, <laughs> verse 3. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That, my dear friends, is the glory of the good news of the gospel. Yes, benefits from Christ, but you get Christ. You walk in union with the one and living God. And I end on this note because I think it would be wrong if I did not touch on it. The gospel is not simply the gate that you enter. The gospel is the ever-present, consistent, and I would argue eternal meditation of the believer. See, I think we make a big mistake when we see the gospel as what we give to unsaved people. No, yes, we do. But the truth of the gospel is on every page of the word, and it is consistent, it should be the consistent meditation of the Christian to declare the good news of the gospel to yourself every single day. And I believe throughout eternity we will be singing praise and glorifying the Son and the Father and the Spirit with the same words, the same truth that we've been declaring to the lost, meditating on for our own heart, for all eternity will be the truths that we hold dear and rejoice in. Father, I pray that the true saving message, the 
precious, sweet news of the gospel. Father, we become even more precious and sweet to us. For Lord, it's an incredible story to ponder what the living life has accomplished. It is accomplished and will accomplish. So Father, my prayer is that we at PCBC would be a people of the gospel. We'd be a people who are excited and ready launch into these truths. For your name's sake, and Father, for the sake of the lost around us, bring us to see what you do. Amen. If we stand and join with us in our last full song, we'll rule the time of that man.